The text for the sermon this morning on which the sermon will focus is verse 10 of Matthew 8. When Jesus heard this, he marveled and said to those who followed him, truly I tell you, with no one in Israel have I found such faith. Beloved congregation of the Lord Jesus Christ, what is faith? We confess in the Heidelberg Catechism, Lord's Day 7, it's a sure knowledge and a firm confidence in the promises of the gospel, the gospel of Jesus Christ. But in the New Testament, the Lord Jesus speaks in a number of places about great faith, also little faith. What is little faith and what is great faith? Well, this morning we'll pay attention to an incident in which the Lord Jesus spoke of faith such as he had not seen in Israel at that time yet. We could say that he described that man's faith then as great faith. Faith at its best, we could say. Faith which we ought to strive to imitate. Faith about which the Lord said, truly I tell you, with no one in Israel have I found such faith. And the theme is then great faith exemplified. And we see three things in connection with that. Faith, it displays great compassion. It shows deep humility and it expresses wonderful certainty. Great faith displays great compassion. A centurion addressed Jesus as he was walking into the town of Capernaum where he had taken up residence. We know from Luke 7 he did that via other people. Now a centurion you might know was the commander of a hundred or so Roman soldiers. A pretty responsible position. And Capernaum, if you check the map of the region, lay on the north shore of the Sea of Galilee. And Galilee was a kind of a, that whole region was a kind of a restless and isolated region as far as Roman control was concerned. So the Roman authorities positioned their best forces in that, that region. And the centurion, therefore, had a very responsible position. He lived in or near Capernaum, probably in a nice villa, as they find in that region nowadays, as the archaeologists find there, a beautiful villa, because he had a pretty high position, and he was obviously well-to-do. He was a Roman, somebody who belonged to the occupying power in Palestine, but he loved the Jewish people, as it says in Luke 7. And that was shown by the fact that, uh, related in that parallel passage, that he had built this synagogue for the Jews in Capernaum. A striking deed for a leader of an occupying power that he had spent a considerable amount of money to build them a new church, so to speak. That certainly showed that he loved the people of God. And that's why, according to Luke's account, the Jewish leaders told Jesus, he's, he's worthy to have you help him. And he needed help because one of his servants was very sick, paralyzed by sickness and suffering terribly, even at the point of death, as we read in Luke and he approached, so he approached Jesus via some elders of the Jews appealing for help for his servant. For his servant. And that says something, doesn't it? The centurion had compassion for this servant of his. The Greek word Matthew uses for servant is actually the word for 
boy, young boy. Poor people in Israel in those days would sometimes contract their children out to wealthy people and they became something like gophers for, the, for those uh, wealthier people. Go over there, do that. Go over there and do, get that. Young boys, servants, who constantly, bond servants, you could say, who constantly did their master's bidding. And so that says something about that centurion, that he, he displayed so much compassion for this boy. There were probably many who would simply take, could take his place if this boy died. No big deal. Centurion could get another one. But the, the centurion treated him like a son. And he had heard how Jesus had healed many people already, so he pleaded with him, Lord, help this boy. Heal him. And congregation, that's a, that's a beautiful feature of great faith then in this man. Faith is genuinely concerned about the well-being of others, especially of those who need help, those who are kind of on the fringes. Faith arouses compassion for, for people like that, even if it costs time, effort, money. For those who are looked down on or who are bullied or disabled in some way, oh, that, that compassion in itself isn't proof of faith. Because people without faith can also show compassion for others. But then they will have different motives. But believers will reflect God's compassion for them. They show compassion to glorify God's compassion for them. And then with the hope that others also come to know that same compassion of God, that they also experience that, that compassion of God in Christ the Savior. Faith opens eyes, opens hearts, opens wallets too for others who need help and need to be shown love. Notice that when he receives that request, Jesus says right away, I will come. I will come and heal him. Jesus was ready right away to go to that man's house, his villa, to help. Willing and ready to give help. And, and see, that's the wonder of his grace, isn't it? He comes to us with compassion too. That's what makes every worship service special. The Lord Jesus comes to us via the gospel here. The Son of God who came into this world as we just remembered at Christmas. He came with great compassion for us to suffer and even to descend into hell and to die for us in order to undergo the full wrath of God against all our sins. He came to make us right with God while we were still sinners. He came to obtain the Holy Spirit for us. And he rose from the dead and is now seated at the right hand of God from where he distributes the benefits of the forgiveness of sins he obtained and this sends out his, the spirit he obtained for us. He comes to us here, every worship service, with his grace and compassion to renew us in his image, in God's image, to arouse great faith and then also faith with compassion for others in our hearts. The gospel of his great compassion 
will not leave believers unaffected. Will not leave us unaffected if we know what Christ has done for us poor sinners in ourselves. We come to the second part of the sermon. Great faith shows deep humility, we see here. Congregation, we continue to see what much faith or great faith is when we look at what the centurion said after Jesus told him he was coming, coming to heal that young servant. He says, Lord, I'm not worthy to have you come under my roof. And he's, he sends out people as Jesus is getting closer to his house. And when he thinks about that, he thinks and confesses, I'm not worthy. I'm not worthy. And that's, that's amazing. That's faith. Because just think, he could have said that the other way around too. He could have thought, well, I'm a port, an important well-to-do and... Yeah, up there, Roman leader. Jesus is just a Jew, member of this nation we occupy here. Just the son of a carpenter, even. He isn't worthy to, to come to me. But he says it exactly the other way around. It's interesting to think about. I am not worthy to have you come under my roof. He knew Jewish law too, that a, a Jew would not come into the house of a foreigner. Now the Greek word translated here as worthy means considerable enough. In other words, the, the centurion says he's not considerable enough, not qualified enough, not sufficiently competent to have Jesus come into his house. And that's interesting to note because remember that in Luke 7, the Jewish elders had said that the centurion was, was worthy to be helped because he had built a synagogue for them. He loved the Jewish nation. So whereas other people considered him eminently worthy to receive Jesus, he himself felt completely differently about that. I'm not worthy, not qualified enough to receive you in my house. And congregation, what deep humility in that, shows in that. You can have many gifts and talents, a lot of knowledge of the Bible, have given much time and money for church and kingdoms, such that others say about you, well, that person is worthy of the Lord's goodness. That person is worthy of being an elder or a deacon. That per person is worthy to be looked up to. But faith like that of the centurion will think, I'm actually not worthy. I'm not worthy. Not qualified enough because I often, so often seek myself, my own recognition. And I can sometimes be too swayed by my own emotions. No, I'm not really competent enough to serve the Lord Jesus and his kingdom and to seek his honor alone. I'm still so inclined to all evil and have only, I have only such a small beginning of that new obedience yet. Deep humility you see before the Lord of life. That shows in faith, great faith. And notice, as I mentioned, that the centurion expressed his unworthiness when Jesus is on the way to his house. So he first asked the Lord Jesus to come and help. But now that Jesus comes closer to his house, he becomes more and more aware of his own unworthiness. His unsuitability to receive him. That's how it is for believers. You see, congregation, the closer to the Lord Jesus you live, the more you see how unworthy you are in yourself of his attention. The more faults you see in yourself. Jesus is the light. And the closer you come to the light, 
the more you see your own sins and shortcomings too. Your unworthiness in yourself to belong to Him. His gospel throws light on your inclination to selfish pride, your envy of others, your lust, lustful thoughts that pass through your mind, selfishness, your selfishness, and so on. And then your soul is like a room full of junk. And the more the light of Christ shines on it, the more junk you see. And that's how it is with great faith, congregation. The closer the Lord Jesus is to you, the more you see your un own unworthiness and the more humble you become. And then you understand what the Apostle Paul was writing about in Romans 7, verse 18. I know that nothing good dwells in me that is in my flesh. For I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. And that's the Apostle Paul. And then he adds near the end of that chapter, Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. That's a statement of great humility then. The thing is, congregation, faith Faith will always bring to deep humility and amazement. How is it possible that the Lord Jesus wants me, of all people, wants to come to me? You see that in what old Elizabeth said when Mary came to visit her. Why is this granted to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? She expresses deep humility and amazement that Mary, pregnant with the Savior, would come to her. She felt unworthy, humble. And it's sad if that amazement and that sense of humility isn't there anymore. And if you think it's no big deal that Jesus comes to you every Sunday... with the proclamation of the forgiveness of all your sins. That you think it's no big deal, okay? Just another thing. You can even dress that way too, eh? Careless. As if it's just another thing you do. And then the sense of awe and the sense of humility and the sense of amazement that comes to you and his presence is gone. And then it so easily becomes you thinking that you're worthy of Jesus. That you choose for him instead of he for you while you were still sinner. No, you, you realize great humility belongs with great faith. Humility and amazement are the marks of great faith even. We come to the third part of the sermon. Great faith expresses wonderful certainty. Congregation, the faith of the centurion exemplifies something else about great faith. Because notice he adds, only say the word and my servant will be healed. See, in his mind, Jesus doesn't even have to come to his house. He only has to say the word. He has the power to say the word and the young servant will be healed of his deadly illness instantly. He believes that. He's certain. Don't bother coming. Just say it. And he explains that by giving an example from his own life. He says, verse 9, For I too am a man under authority. I too am a man under authority. And that was true because the centurion was a man under authority, the authority of King Herod at the time. Herod had appointed him, and the centurion's authority came from above, from him. And then he adds that with that authority that he had received, he could say to one soldier, go, and he would go. 
and to another come and he would come and to another servant do this and he would do it. Those people all obey him because they know that he has received authority from King Herod. He has the authority. And you realize what the, the centurion is saying then is that the same is the case with the Lord Jesus. He has God himself above him. He's not just a carpenter's son, but he has been sent by God Almighty. And because God has sent him and appointed him, Jesus has the authority that he has even to say to an illness, leave that boy. Notice, by the way, that at the end of Matthew 8, we're told that the crowds were astonished at his teaching. At the end of Matthew 7, the crowds were astonished at his teaching, for he was teaching them as one who has authority and not as their scribes. The centurion saw that authority too, and he realized it is from above, from God. And he saw what has become much clearer to us now, right? Because Jesus was the Son of God who was put to death, who came here, was put to death and then raised from the dead and taken up into heaven and is now seated at the right hand of God where he has received all power and authority in heaven and on earth. And therefore, when he says the word... He only has to say the word. It'll happen. He is the word. The centurion accepted that. He didn't know everything, but he accepted that already from the Lord Jesus, about the Lord Jesus. He was certain of that, in fact. Just say the word, and my servant will be healed. And see, that's great faith. Great faith, congregation. Why? Just imagine if the centurion had thought to himself, well, let's, Je let's let Jesus, this Jesus, come to my place and then say something to my servant and then we'll see what happens. And if I see that my servant gets better, then I'll believe that he has authority from God. But only then. But faith doesn't say I need to see it before I believe it. No, it says, I believe Jesus. I believe Jesus can and will do what he says. And that's faith, great faith. Think of Hebrews 11. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. It's being certain that the Lord Jesus can and do what he has promised, even if you don't see any of it. He's going to do it. He has promised me forgiveness of sins in the Holy Spirit to give me a renewed heart, a heart that hates sin and finds it a love and delight to live according to God's will. Jesus has the power to do that. He needs to just say the word. So faith says, Lord Jesus, I know that you will do that for me too. You'll hear my prayer, you will forgive my sin, and you will renew my heart so I hate that sin and so I can walk with you. You will hear my prayer because you're both willing and able. You have the authority and the power to work that for me, to change my heart. But you know what we sometimes all too easily do? We pray for forgiveness and renewal of heart. And then we live on and maybe we wait and see, maybe see if anything really changes for us. If we notice that he'll actually work that for us. Wait and see if I really feel that I really am forgiven, 
and that I really do grow in desiring God and living for Him. The thing is, then we want to see first, and then, and then we'll believe. But true faith is believing without seeing. It's being certain that it will happen, even if I don't see it now. It's going to Jesus and beseeching Him over and over again, maybe, to change your heart so that that sin doesn't attract you anymore, but loving Him and desiring His will draws you more and more. Lord, work that in me, please. You will do that. You can do that by your Spirit. And you confess that even before you have felt or noticed anything. I will be renewed again. I can leave this sin behind in the power of the Lord. And that's faith. That's trusting in Jesus' willingness and in his power to help you in your time of need. Before you notice any change at all. And being certain that he will do as he promised. And you know something? If you believe that like that, you will see it too. You will see it in time. You will experience that. He does what he has promised. And the thing is, right, we expect too little of our Savior quite often. Luther said, faith is like a jar. Maybe I mentioned it before. Great faith is like a big jar. And then the Lord can give you much if you, you expect much. Little faith is like a little jar, little container. And then the Lord can only give you a little. So the greater faith is, the more the Spirit of Jesus can work in your heart. But great faith doesn't really need to sense that. It simply trusts in the Lord and in His Word, trusts in His willingness and power, even without experiencing that. And that's then the work of the Spirit in itself, great faith itself. In fact, Jesus notes something else in connection with great faith in the text. He says to those who followed him, truly I tell you, with no one in Israel have I found such faith. He had not found such great faith in Israel among the covenant people who had the Old Testament, all the promises of God, who had read or heard the Bible, the Old Testament explained so many times already from childhood on, who had heard so much from the Lord Jesus as he went about preaching, had seen him perform many miracles. But this centurion, who had only recently come into contact with the God of the covenant and with Jesus, had only heard rumors of Jesus, that man believed. He believed. He had great faith. Makes you think of the Queen of Sheba, who had only heard rumors about God's people and his king. And his king, and that brings to mind the city of Nineveh. Only heard one short sermon from Jonah, but the whole city repented. And then think of the wise men from the east who had only seen a star and who had heard that the king was to be born in Bethlehem and who went and believed in him, brought him gifts. Those people had only heard a little, rumors even, but they believed great faith. And then, therefore, Jesus follows the words about great faith in the text with a warning. Sadly, there are those who have known the Bible and heard it proclaimed their whole life long, who have seen examples of faith all around them, who do not believe and who die in their unbelief. Jesus describes them as sons of the kingdom who will be thrown into outer darkness. And that's a warning. A warning. Brothers and sisters, boys and girls, pray humbly, but also confidently for the Spirit of the Lord to work great faith in your hearts. Because that's what he promised you at your baptism, the renewal and you can be certain that he loves to hear that prayer. And he will answer a prayer like that. Be certain of that. Because he's willing. Incredibly willing and also mighty 
to work great faith in you by his spirit. Great faith like that Roman centurion had. In other words, a faith that's accompanied also by great compassion for others, is deeply humble and is wonderfully certain about all his promises. Amen.